an enormous honour to be asked to give a keynote at Beira, even at very short notice. Um, when I was asked to do this, which was um, just about the beginning of August, I, I did say that um, perhaps I could uh, fill the slot by just showing my holiday snaps. Um, and I'm not going to do that, but I did want to start by talking a little bit about what was one of the most interesting books I read over the course of the summer. It's um, hugely readable, although actually quite forbidding title, uh, Marguerite Fox's book, uh, The Riddle of the Labyrinth. And it's her account of the deciphering of Linear B in the 1940s and 1950s. Something over 2,000 clay tablets had been unearthed at the Cretan Palace of Knossos by Sir Arthur Evans, an Oxford archaeologist, in 1901. Dating from the years between 1850 and 1450 BC, they were covered in a script the like of which no one had ever seen. And as Fox comments, the challenge to deciphering them was that they were written in an unknown language, in an unknown script, about unknown topics. Evans called the script Linear B, referring to the linear construction of the characters and the fact that it's slightly postdated, a rather different Linear A script. And the task of deciphering Linear B took half a century. Half a century of frankly obsessive work by utterly determined individuals. And Fox's account reads like a detective story. Ultimately, it's a triumph of research. It's a combination of mind-numbingly patient transcription, comparison and analysis, hunting out patterns in the script with flashes of interpretive genius. Before, in 1953, Michael Ventris is an amateur scholar. By day, he was an architect de designing schools for the then Ministry of Education, cracked the code and deciphered the tablets. It's a great story, but the real fascination of Fox's book isn't in the outcome, but in her account of the research process. And the real hero of the book isn't Arthur Evans, nor Michael Ventris, but Alice Cobra, a now almost forgotten classicist in New York, who in a series of technical papers in the 1940s made huge progress, identifying the nature of the script, unlocking syllabic patterns, and pointing the way to a solution, a solution that was frustratingly just out of reach when she died, almost certainly of cancer, at the age of 43 in 1950. Cobra's work was done around a punishingly heavy teaching schedule at Brooklyn College. Her research was done late at night. And the 1940s were tough times for research. Cobra's communication with other scholars depended on a slow transatlantic postal service. Paper was rationed in the UK, and it was scarce everywhere. When Cobra couldn't get notebooks, she began hand-cutting two by three inch cards from any spare paper she could find. Backs of greeting cards, exam book covers, checkout slips from the college library. By the time of her death, she'd cut and completed 180,000 of those slips. And there are some of them, and the connection to what she probably died of is pretty clear from the front of two of the boxes. The availability of academic journals was limited by the availability of paper. Travel was expensive and difficult, a rare luxury. Evans made Cobra's job more difficult by making available only a small number of the excavated tablets and then only through, as you might imagine, poor quality monochrome photographs. When she did manage to get to Oxford on a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1947, she had just five weeks to copy out almost 2,000 inscriptions from Evans's notes. 
It was in this unprepossessing environment for research that the breakthrough was made. When Ventris cracked the code, he didn't just make, make the meaning of the clay tiles accessible, he rewrote assumptions about the ancient world. It turns out that the clay tiles were the day-to-day -day accounts of the Knossos Palace, recording the movement of goods and people, and that Linear B was a transliteration of a form of Greek, a form of Greek a thousand years older than the Greek of Homer. And it turns out, moreover, that these uh, illiterate Greeks had invaded and conquered literate Crete, which is where the language transliterated, and which had produced the older, much rarer, and if anybody is looking for a little sideline research, still undeciphered linear A. News of Ventris's achievement was published on the same day as the news of Hillary's descent, ascent of Everest. And Fox quotes a verdict that people in other societies have climbed mountains, but the recovery of the key to an extinct writing system is a thing which has never been attempted, let alone accomplished. So I'm going to begin with a riddle as well. What, if anything, is the connection between Margaret Fox's story and the world of education, and more specifically, what I'm calling the emergence of an autonomous school system. And that's the puzzle for the next uh, 35 minutes or so, and I hope that some connections emerge as we go on. What I'm going to do is to reflect on the development of an autonomous school system, consider its implications for education research. There are many other implications, but I want to focus on the implications for research. And in doing so, I'm going to draw pretty extensively on the work of the Academies Commission, of which I was a member. The Commission published its report in January this year, was chaired by Christine Gilbert, formerly Chief Inspector of Schools. The other commissioners were Becky Francis, who's sitting quite near the front listening, and has also read this text uh, from King's, uh, and Brett Vigdort's chief executive of Teach First. We took our evidence from ma three main sources, from written submissions, from oral sessions, and from a scrutiny of the published research on school autonomy in general, and academies in particular. There is nothing new about autonomy for publicly funded schools in England. Arguably, school autonomy is a characteristic of English education, traceable back to the curious political settlements struck in 1870, 1902 and 1944, between state-funded and voluntary, often religious or charitable, provision of education. In England, direct grant, voluntary control and voluntary aided schools always enjoyed varying degrees of autonomy whilst receiving public funding. In 1988, Grant maintained schools built on an extended autonomy, and in 1997, the translation of Grant maintained into foundation schools recognised significant legal distinctions with community schools. The introduction of city academies in 2002 needs to be seen in that light. Not necessarily revolutionary, but a further experiment with autonomy. And indeed, one of my predecessors as director of the IOE, Sir Peter Newsom, argues that city academies, academies are little different in practice from voluntary aided schools. As long ago as 2004, the OECD argued that England had the second most autonomous school system in the world, with only Dutch schools more autonomous. Nevertheless, the expansion of the academies programme under the coalition has been dramatic. In May 2010, there were 203 academies. By November 2012, there were 2,456. And by last month, 3,086. And free schools, university technical colleges and studio schools also emerging at a pretty rapid pace. These are also academies. It's a new education landscape, and it's developing with astonishing speed. The academy is now the dominant form of secondary education in England, gathering pace in primary. But more than this, the idea of autonomy has taken hold in the school system. The idea of an autonomous system goes beyond the idea of self-managing schools. It encompasses the freedom of schools to make decisions over staffing, resources and curriculum, but it goes further. It involves new forms of school governance, particularly in the formation of clusters or chains of schools. In an autonomous school system, the responsibility for strategic decisions lies increasingly in the hands of schools and school groups. 
It may be, as David Hargreaves describes it, self-improving, but it's highly decentralised and it may be more fragmented. In fact, autonomy doesn't quite get at the current state of English schools. In many respects, schools and school chains are sovereign, with, by international standards, exceptional levels of responsibility and decision-making. And I think this is a really significant shift in English education. Now, some of you will know, not all, I suspect, that there are different types of academy. We can make crude distinctions in England between community schools and academies, but there are more subtle distinctions to be made between community schools, voluntary aided schools, voluntary controlled schools, and different sorts of academy. In the report, we identified three types of academy. Academies Mark I, introduced by the Labour government in 2002, were a new generation of schools intended to transform performance in areas of profound social and educational challenge. The model and the mission were clear. The original school was closed and a new school opened, sponsored by a philanthropist, keen, however naively, to make a difference to the lives of poor children and young people in deprived areas. The ambition, business acumen of the sponsor, was seen as key in establishing a new school outside governance by the local authority and in transformed buildings. Those new academies were strategic investments in change. They had start-up funds, freedoms to vary curriculum, the school year, staff pay, conditions of service. Over the next eight years, the Labour government rolled out academies seeking to transform educational outcomes in weak schools. And when the supply of uh, appropriately minded sponsors began to run out, uh, the original model shifted to Academies Mark II, which allowed organisations including universities, charities and even local authorities themselves to act as sponsors. Start-up funding was abolished, more conditions were specified in academy funding agreements and few academies had as much investment in their buildings as original ones. By May 2010, there were 203 of those Mark I and Mark II academies with 60 more planned. The overall performance of those academies has been the subject of extensive debate, often between people in this room. Some, including Mossbourne in Hackney, frequently quoted, appear to have demonstrated stunning success, but the Commission found that that success was far from universal. And indeed, it's been suggested that many previously poorly performing schools in disadvantaged areas have, just done, have done just as well as academies. The 2010 Academies Act transformed the Academies programme and introduced Mark III Academies. At this point, academy status was open to all schools judged by Ofsted to be outstanding and to some judged to be performing well, uh, the decision to become an academy on a single vote of the governing body. And developments since the publication of uh, our report have also now moved us on to Academies Mark IV, schools which are performing below government floor targets and which have been brokered into forced academy conversion with a successful school as sponsor. Many of these conversions have been extremely controversial locally and nationally. And moreover, the largely permissive nature of the 2010 Academies Act meant that, just to go back to it, Mark three academies in practice comprise a variety of forms and finally, as I've said, free schools, university technical colleges and studio schools are all technically academies. But even this understates the complexity of an autonomous school system. For all the focus on academies, the idea of independence extends considerably further than the 3,000 academies. And some commentators have argued that there are a few freedoms that academies exercise that are not actually available anyway to local authority maintained or voluntary aided schools. One example to make the point, academies are no longer required to teach the national curriculum. But given the persistence of accountability measures and the range of what Tim Oates calls control factors at work in the curriculum, the formal regulatory freedom to vary the curriculum in practice makes little difference. 
numerous local authority maintained schools have established federation arrangements, some with academies and some with other local authority schools. Ultimately, of course, the real limitation on autonomy in the school system is the overall accountability framework. We have an autonomous school system that remains tightly performance managed around a number of highly specified short-term attainment outcomes. Nonetheless, what I think academization, which is an extremely ugly word, has done is to embed a concept of autonomy for all schools in pursuing improved performance through a variety of means against those measures. Now, a key feature of the autonomous school system that has emerged is the school group, or chain. And it's extremely difficult to establish up-to-date figures on chains, so here are some out-of-date figures. Uh, there are probably something like 500 school groups now operating in England, from single pairing arrangements which are often a means to secure financial and educational viability to small rural schools, to large school operator groups. United Learning now comprises about 30 schools, ARC about 20, Harris moving this autumn beyond 30, and the Kemnall Academies Trust comprising something over 50 schools. I think the school group is a genuinely new feature of English publicly funded schooling. It's a normally non-geographic cluster of schools with integrated management, procurement, financial and administrative systems, and in some cases, very strongly corporate approaches to school leadership practices and teaching. This is what an autonomous school system looks like. Highly complex, with multiple layers of, interdependent, of independence and interdependence, and the sharp-eared amongst you may have detected a first parallel with Margaret Fox's story. As the experiences of Alice Cover and Michael Ventris demonstrate, complexity is good for research. It's a fecund ground for the imaginative development of practice. In complexity, there's a great deal to be explained and a great deal to be studied. Autonomy brings opportunities for research. Autonomy creates spaces in which differences can be explored and evaluated. I think the Academy's Commission report offers a fruitful agenda for further research. The dynamics of admissions in a more loosely regulated admissions code. The nature, organisation, motivation and outcomes of school-to-school -school support for improvement. The changing roles of governors who are company directors in academies, governance in federations and chains, the impacts of an autonomous school system on provision for special needs, implications for the provision but low, of, of low incidence but high intensity additional needs. The different practices and performances of autonomous schools and school groups, the interactions between these practices and classroom and institutional processes should be fertile ground for research, just as they have been in the increasingly complex governance structures of public and charter schools in the United States. At the IOE, my colleague Rob Hyam has begun to explore the commissioning and provision of free schools, unlocking challenging issues about governance, control and their relationship dis disadvantage. Colleagues at AQA have explored student perceptions of UTCs. My OE colleagues Carol Taylor and Karen Spence-Thomas lead work on the ways in which teaching school alliances develop their research remit in support of pedagogy and professional development. So one headline is, as I say, autonomy should be good news for research. But if autonomy and diversification and the complexity that follows should prove fertile ground for an education research agenda, there's another side to the story. Alice Cober, working in isolation on homemade index cards, is a reminder that the material conditions under which research is conducted can be a real challenge, however rich the intellectual and research question. The dynamics of an autonomous school system 
and especially one operating under conditions of tight financial constraint, pose particular challenges to research. Autonomous schools can become autarkic schools, looking inward and concerned with their own practices and development. One of the arguments elaborated about the school system being created following the 2010 Act is that it's inter, not independent. Whether for reasons of economy or enhanced effectiveness, schools are being encouraged to collaborate one with another. Whereas it's argued school autonomy in the 1990s involved individual schools working alone, it's argued that now autonomy involves schools choosing partners and working collaboratively. And as I've noted, federations, clusters, collaboratives and chains are growing rapidly. And in some cases, these are formal, tightly managed governance structures, such as the Harris Academies or United Learning. In others, there are clusters of schools collaborating for specific purposes, often uh, for school improvement. There's an example, the Bradford Partnership. The Bradford Partnership is a cluster bringing together all the secondary schools in the city of Bradford. But it is for, this is important formally established as a company limited by guarantee. In others, there are looser confederations for the sharing of expertise, resources, legal services or purchasing. And there's some evidence that a consequence is an inward focus within the group or the cluster. So that collaboration is rich and richly structured between schools in the cluster, but constrained within the group. Where collaborations have a formal and legal form, some of the details of the collaboration are tightly protected. The intellectual property in collaboration belonging to the group or operator, or the operator. So we start to find school clusters school groups, developing dis distinctive curricula, distinctive pedagogies, distinctive approaches to teacher training and professional development. Harris Academies, predominantly in southwest London, make extensive use of what Dan Moynihan, Chief Operating Officer, calls Harris in a Box, a succinct summary of the approach to teaching and learning adopted and branded across the academies. And it's been highly successful in terms of outcome measures in transforming schools in southwest London. ARC Academies runs its own research and development operation and has undertaken a major curriculum development initiative, Mathematics Mastery, based on a Singaporean model. Now, I think it's almost certainly the case that groups and clusters of schools are likely to be able to undertake innovation in a more structured, more coherent and better researched way than individual schools. And the best of collaborative innovation is just that, structured, coherent and researched. But where concern with branding and commercial intellectual property issues begin to predominate in schooling, as my colleague Stephen Ball has begun to explore with uh, great lucidity, researchability can take second place. Not all innovative practices are open to scrutiny. Moreover, what I've called autarkic schools could begin to operate as closed systems. And there's some evidence, I think, that some of the groups emerging are starting to think in those ways drawing together a strongly coherent but strongly protected set of arrangements in which defined curricula, often defined pedagogy, are elaborated, in which the training of new and existing teachers is organised around the delivery of that defined curricula, deploying the defined pedagogy, and where practices are unexplored and unevaluated. There's an indication of some of this in some of the American experience. Uh, the Relay Graduate School of Education was established as an independent, 
for-profit graduate school of education in 2008, meeting the needs of some groups of charter schools. The rhetoric of Relay is worth exploring in a little bit of detail. So on the left, um, our education system has failed to keep pace as society has moved forward, creating an achievement gap that has grown from decade to decade. At the centre of this education crisis are low-income youths in urban communities across America. Fueling the crisis has been a nationwide failure by, generously, most university-based teacher education programmes to prepare teachers for the realities of the 21st century classroom. As leaders of educational reform, the founders of Relay Graduate School of Education recognise the need for teachers who can close the achievement gap and give our youth a promising future. I don't think we did disagree with that. So they were inspired to create a new graduate school that immediately and effectively addresses the demand for new teachers. Uh, Relay is the first independent, that's really interesting use of the word independent, graduate school of education to be credentialed in New York in more than 80 years. Um, it was launched in 2008 by master teachers from three of the nation's leading non-profit charter school management organisations. It provides an urban teacher training programme incorporating the best teaching practices in high-performing charter schools. Now, I thought that by this stage, um, you might like to sample the work of the Relay Graduate School of Education. Kids misbehave for all sorts of reasons. Most often, though, it's because directions aren't clear. Tamika Boykin, she gets it right. On top of your take home is a piece of paper. You will have two minutes to write down as many compound words as you can. The scholar who comes up with the most compound words will win an after school snack by yours truly, Miss Boykin. You will win a cool after school snack whoever comes up with the most compound words. Oh, as many, as many in two minutes, whoever has the most. Let's go. As soon as you get to your seat, you can begin because I'm bringing my timer right away. Three takeaways. One, she has a finite amount of time. Two, she tells them when to begin. And three, she means it. She's got a timer. I'm Rob Piccolo, senior designer at Relay Graduate School of Education, and that is great teaching. Now, my point isn't, I don't think I can get the next sentence. When you've watched several of those, you end up wanting to thump people, I have to tell you. <laughs> but I've done that, so you don't need to. Um, I don't want to engage with the training model or the assumptions that are being made by Relay. What I want to stress, um, and I think there's an implication of strongly autonomous schooling systems, is to uh, reject traditional assumptions about the development of practice and traditional vehicles, in that case conventional university schools of education, for developing and disseminating practice and knowledge. And I think this is especially the case where, as is the case in education, professional practice is institutionally weak, with few structures that are in place to mediate between the frenetic change of pace of policy change and practical implementation. In an autonomous system, without strong mediating institutions, schools and teachers will react, sometimes overreact, to perceived policy change or will become inward-looking and defensive. And when I was preparing this, I did look at the lecture, a very interesting lecture that John Coles, chief exec at United Learning, formerly a senior civil servant in the DfE, gave. And I think he says more or less uh, what I've just said, or exemplifies more or less what I've just said. Now, there are disciplines um, in which strong university research and teaching go alongside strongly autonomous professional practice. One of those is architecture. 
back to Margaret Fox. Turns out that one of Michael Ventris's professional preoccupations was with the generation and dissemination of knowledge in distributed architectural practices. Another is management, where university business schools have established strong identity around meeting the needs of often autarkic organisations. Research in architecture and management underpins teaching in both. There are some particular challenges in such a setting, of course, and many of those have been debated extensively in thinking about the mechanisms uh, around knowledge mobilisation in education. They include the relationships between research, policy and practice, and the nature of knowledge, its generation and dissemination. But academic disciplines also reply, uh, rely on a material infrastructure. In architecture and management, that infrastructure is developed through strong applied relationships between academics and practitioners. In education research, the material infrastructure has often been developed by mediating in organisations, research councils, charities, local authorities. Putting it at its crudest, neither schools nor their sponsors have been major commissioners or funders of education research, at least until now. The challenge of securing a viable material base for education research in an autonomous school system is precisely this. If funds are devolved increasingly to schools and school groups, there is a significant challenge for academic researchers in securing the base for serious research activity. Now, it's easy to overstate the issue of material constraint. There are significant research, and particularly research and development funds, available in this emerging autonomous system. The Education Endowment Fund is the large, obvious player, and its generous funding base essentially derives from a diversion of what were the research funds held in the Department for Education. EEF has a strong research mission, and a strong mission to improve practice through research. It's undertaking large-scale trials work in schools for perhaps the first time at scale in education. Its critics argue that its mission is to secure particular types of research knowledge and particular forms of inquiry to the exclusion of others. Its establishment, I think, is a major shift, shift in the terms of trade for education research. Now, my argument this, morning, this afternoon is reasonably simple that the school system is changing, changing very quickly. Academicisation, and I don't mean by that the establishment of new school types, but the development of an autonomous school system is well advanced. An autonomous school system, as opposed to a system in which there happen to be some autonomous schools, has enormous implications for the way schools teach, work and operate. The development of more complex, more finely nuanced, less integrated school system will have impacts, some predictable, some less so, for pupils. Understanding and explaining them is a major priority for research. There is a powerful and pressing research agenda. Complexity and innovation are the midwives of new knowledge, particularly for applied research. At the same time, there are features of the school system which is emerging which provide serious challenges to academic research. The tendency for school groups and individual schools to look inwards, certainly beyond university departments of education, to source their knowledge, expertise and knowledge creation practices. The tendency for funding in an autonomous system to flow to the point of practice demand thoughtful and imaginative responses from academics. Education research, of course, is a large and diverse discipline and there'll be far, far more imaginative responses than I can make. But to conclude, um, it, might be sense of, it might be useful just to push some thinking. In the face of challenges, it's always necessary to listen hard to uncomfortable and often ill-informed voices. Critics, including this Ben Goldacre's review uh, for the DfE, have suggested that too little educational research has succeeded in adding direct value to practice and that we lack a research and knowledge management infrastructure to move forwards. But that already weak infrastructure in this country is under serious pressure. Changes to both initial teacher education and post-experience professional development have shifted resource and initiative to schools. Beera has acknowledged 
that university researchers do not have a monopoly on research. Knowledge creation in and by a diverse school system is likely to play an increasingly important role as resource, innovation and development moves to schools and school groups. But there are perhaps two implications for researchers. The first is that I think an increasingly distributed and dispersed school system will need more integrative research approaches. As school practices diversify, we'll need research ideas and frames that set individual schools and school groups into wider contexts. Some of that thinking, but not, I think, yet sufficiently, underpins the approach of the Education Endowment Fund. It does follow that there will be an increasing premium on quantitative research methodologies or on mixed methodologies that are able to locate individual practices in a strongly understood context. We've learned to count better in education. I suspect we'll, learn to need, we'll need to learn to count better still and to use counting as a frame in which to set diversity and distinctiveness. And my second proposition is that if we need strongly integrative research that enables us to capture system-wide experiences, we'll also need more rigorous, practice-focused local research that elucidates, explains and understands what's happening in classrooms, in schools and school groups and can help us to engage with questions about what outcomes and processes are considered worthwhile. Education, of course, is especially characterised by moral purpose and research activity and the wider structures will need to continue to engage with questions about what outcomes and processes are worthwhile. But the tendency for autonomous institutions to face inwards, to be concerned with developing distinctiveness and in some cases to protecting that distinctiveness may make that more difficult than it has been. We will need new and distinctive relationships between academic research and practice, structured and configured differently in order to enhance information flow and knowledge mobilisation. We need to address the shifts by simultaneously think, doing more work to develop clinical practitioner researchers who can work in schools to diagnose issues and draw in evidence to support teacher education and school improvement linked to increasingly quantitative researchers who can stand back and make sense of the bigger picture. Individual universities can do some of this. And there are interesting developments happening in almost every institution from which people are drawn in this room. But I think we also need more thinking on what the education, research and development infrastructure needs to look like. There may be merit in thinking about what the equivalent of a National Institute for Clinical Excellence might look like for education. I've been, amongst others, involved in thinking about how a member-led Royal College of Teaching could operate. I began this lecture with Margaret Fox's account of how disparate researchers solved the riddle of the labyrinth. It turns out that isolated, separated researchers did solve the riddle, but it took them a long time, 50 years from the excavation of the tiles to a solution. That's much too slow. Education researchers, the universities who employ them, have often been in inventive in finding ways to get close to schools. In an autonomous school system, I suspect that will be a highly prized skill and a huge amount may depend on us getting it right rather more quickly than 50 years. Thank you very much. <laughs>